Hi there, my name is Marcus Cleaver. Um, a little while ago, Mel asked me to do a lecture for you on truth commissions, but unfortunately, I'm not going to be around when that lecture is due to take place. So I thought instead I would put some slides together and do a video lecture for you to help with your coursework. This means we're going to look at a few different things. So the background to truth commissions to start off with, then looking at the advantages and disadvantages of truth commissions, uh, and finally also looking at a particular example. So the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which also happens to be the subject for my PhD. Uh, I hope you find it useful and helpful for writing your work. Um, and without further ado, let's get started. So the first thing to consider in relation to truth commissions is that they are a mode of transitional justice. In other words, moving from one old political regime to a new political regime in as smooth a manner as possible. The first attempt at transitional justice took place after World War II with the Nazi war trials. This was an attempt to put some of the highest ranking Nazi officials on trial for the crimes that they perpetrated during this period of German history. So now we're going to look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of trials as a means of transitional justice. First, the advantages. So these were seen as deserved punishments for the crimes. So a number of the high ranking Nazi officials um, received death by hanging as their punishment. And this was seen as just desserts for some of the horrendous crimes that were perpetrated during the time, especially thinking about things like the Holocaust, for example, uh, as well as other crimes that were committed. Secondly, we have the denazification process. So the Nazi period in Germany was an especially low point and the trials were seen as putting a full stop at the end of this period to allow Germany to move forward. Finally, another advantage was that this was seen as a beginning for international justice as we know it today. So shortly after the war trials were concluded, the International Court of Justice was set up and also we have consideration of the UN Declaration on Human Rights that sought to examine the human rights abuses that were discovered during the trials and make sure that this would never happen again. One of the main disadvantages was that this was seen as a form of victor's justice. In other words, all of the prosecutors and judges were from Britain, France, America and the USSR, the countries that had won World War II. The idea being that this wasn't really an opportunity to punish individual war criminals, but more a way for the victorious countries to consolidate their victory in World War II. There were also questions raised as to whether this was really a fair trial. Many of the defendants were really presumed guilty rather than presumed innocent, as would be normally be the case. And there's also a principle in law that there shouldn't be any adverse public comment on the defendants before a verdict is reached. Obviously, this was completely absent in the aftermath of World War II. There are also questions about whether this was really a chance for Germany to move on. What we're saying here is that just because a few Nazi war criminals were punished or hanged for their crimes, does this really give chance to, uh, for Germany to move on as a society? In particular, thinking about places like East Germany that after World War II now came under Soviet control. So what are the alternatives to trials as a means of transitional justice? Well, between 1964 and 1985, Brazil was subject to a military dictatorship. However, in 1979, the Brazilian government passed an amnesty law that effectively shielded human rights violators from prosecution. On the one hand, this had the advantage that it allowed Brazil to transition to a democracy uh, from the military dictatorship in a peaceful manner. On the other hand, it has the disadvantage that those who had committed horrible crimes were never to stand trial for those crimes. An alternative would be reparations to be paid to victims who have suffered from human rights violations. This has the advantage that at least it focuses on the victim's plight rather than simply on the perpetrators of crimes. But once again, the problem is that those perpetrators will never stand trial for what they have done during that particular period. Uh, memorials is potentially cheaper than reparations, um, but the question that would be raised with memorials is to what extent does it really allow society to move forward? OK, memorials allow for a remem remembrance of the past and what has occurred before, but realistically, does it re mean that human rights violations will never occur again? Finally, perhaps one of the most effective means of transitional justice is institutional reforms. This means looking at the institutions that occurred before the transition and examining why those institutions allowed for human rights violations to occur. 
Once we understand why those institutions were problematic or faulty in some way, we can reform those institutions to prevent any future human rights violations occurring ever again. Now let's move on to examine truth commissions. This is a picture of all of the truth commissions that have ever occurred in the world. Uh, this was taken at the Museo de la Memoria y los Drecos Humanos, or the Museum of Memory and Human Rights, based in Chile. Um, and let's have a look at some of the founding principles behind truth commissions. So the key one is the right to truth. This is recognised often as a piece of customary international law. Uh, there's reference made it to, to it in the UN Commission report I put at the top there. Um, also, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has also recognised this right to truth amongst people. Furthermore, there is the idea of the right to a remedy as well. This is often also recognised as a piece of international law. Thinking in a European context, the European Convention on Human Rights allows for the right to a remedy under Article 13. Finally, an important part of truth commissions is the uh, right to freedom of information as well. Again, I put another UN resolution at the bottom there that puts about the right to the truth and expresses in particular the importance of freedom of information. So why should we have truth commissions? Who cares? Why should they be put forward as an alternative means of transitional justice? Well, there's a number of examples that I've put there that I think explain the point quite well. So if we have truth commissions, we can understand the causes of violence. It's about going to the root of the problem, understanding why human rights violations occurred and then being able to address them. Preventing the exacerbation of social polarisation is also important. So often when there has been military dictatorships or, as we'll see, apartheid regimes, as in South Africa, this has led to social polarisation not only between communities, but also within communities as well. And so having the truth out there allows for um, these social groups to come back together and join together uh, and understand why they became polarised in the first place. Thirdly, we also talked when considering the alternatives to uh, trials as a means of transitional justice, that things like reparations and uh, memorials provide a voice for victims. Truth commissions go a step further and actually give victims the opportunity to speak, often in front of cameras, and to have their stories reported. This idea of the victim's voice being heard is especially important and a key characteristic of truth commissions. So think that's thinking about the past. I've also put there about moving forward together. So the idea behind transitional justice is not only just to examine the past, but also to move forward together as a country, as a society. And truth commissions, through understanding um, the problems that have occurred, help countries to actually move forward. Um, and at the bottom there, I've also put a question for you. So what if there was only denial, silence and suspicion? In other words, what if the truth was not really allowed to break free? What if countries just moved forward and tried not to do so in such a way that had no form of transitional justice? The reality is that the new political system would probably not last very long whatsoever. And so truth commissions seek to address this problem and establish a long term solution for uh, transitional justice. So a short history of truth commissions here. Argentina in 1983 really had the first truth commission as we would know it today, called the National Com Commission on the Disappearance of Persons. Again, this was a response to the military dictatorship that took over in Argentina and produced the Nunsa Mas or Never Again report um, that details all of the abuses that occurred between this period, including things like disappearances, kidnappings, tortures. Uh, and in fact, the Nunza Mass report is a bestseller in Argentina uh, and has been constantly in print since it was published in 1984. Um, other countries have also had truth commissions as well. So Chile, for example, in 1991 also had their response to it. Um, truth commissions are a particular feature of South American transitional justice uh, and a lot of the examples take place in South America. South Africa, I've already mentioned in the introduction to this video, and we'll look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission a bit later on. More recently, Sri Lanka has had a truth commission as well. Um, you may remember in the news there was the uh, war between the government and the Tamil Tigers that concluded it in around 2011, and the truth commission there was seen as a response to that. 
The Sri Lankan one is particularly interesting to examine it because it was criticised widely in international circles for being a bit of a washover. In other words, government abuses that took place during that time weren't really explored in detail and it was debatable whether the Truth Commission really was uh, an opportunity for the country to move forward or more a means for the government in Sri Lanka to uh, absolve itself of culpability. Finally, the most recent example of a truth commission that will hopefully take place is in Colombia. Now, Colombia has suffered from la violencia, or the violence as it is generally called, since the 1960s. Um, but in November 2012, the two parties came together, the president led by Juan Manuel Santos uh, and the leader of the FARC rebels, uh, Rodrigo Londoño, came together in Havana to discuss peace terms. Now, in June, they agreed that a truth commission should be set up when a peace deal is finally reached. Uh, and it will be interesting to watch this space and see how this progresses and whether the uh, truth commission is a success or not. Now, the ICTJ stands for the International Centre for Transitional Justice and is a Brazilian based pressure group that looks at truth commissions and other means of transitional justice. They identify three key objectives that any truth commission should aim for. And you'll notice that if you look at numbers one, two and three, they relate respectively to the past, the present and the future. So establishing the facts surrounding violent events is a way of looking into a country's past. Protecting and empowering victims is a way for victims to feel safe and empowered by the experience of the Truth Commission. And finally, moving forward and establishing a long term solution, Truth Commission should inform policy and promote institutional and social change. The ICTJ also looks at some of the key characteristics of a truth commission. So we've already talked a lot about the focus on victims, how compared with trials and other means of transitional justice, the focus here is on the victims of abuses and not those who have perpetrated the abuses. In particular, there's a focus on human rights that I've mentioned there. Um, and also an extended period of investigation is a common characteristic of truth commissions. So the South African Truth Commission is, for example, published in about five or six volumes. The uh, Argentinian one is about 50,000 pages long, including, you know, all of the different types of abuses that have occurred and all of the different victim stories. So no victim has uh, precedent over another victim, for example. There's a large amount of primary evidence, as well as the hearings taking a long time. This means that the recordings and the transcriptions of victim stories means that there is a huge amount of primary evidence. Um, this means makes it harder to write the report on the one hand, um, but it has the advantage that this primary evidence is then available for anyone who wants to go through it and examine it in more detail. One of the interesting ideas behind truth commissions is that they don't necessarily offer universal amnesties there will still be prosecutions for serious human rights abuses and the evidence that's gathered, gathered in truth commissions uh, can complement this criminal justice process when those trials do occur. Now, how should a truth commission have legitimacy? Well, there's a number of different ways that that can occur. So in terms of it being credible, um, this means having members or commissioners of the Truth Commission who have excellent moral and professional reputations. Um, there has to also be credibility in the form of independence from political interference. Um, there should also be transparent procedures that I've put at the bottom um, and there should be governmental support. So the work of the Truth Commission should be supported by the government, not only financially, but also the report that it eventually comes up with, even if that report is, is um, critical of the government, as was the case in South Africa. Uh, most importantly, I would argue there is also has to be a mandate from society. In other words, if a truth commission doesn't have the backing or the faith that, of a society which it represents, then it is not going to be successful as a means of transitional justice. So now we've looked at truth commissions in general, let's consider a particular example and examine its own successes and failings. In South Africa, the National Party came to power in 1948 and immediately began a policy of apartheid. Apartheid literally translates as separateness and meant that blacks and whites in the country had different facilities. So there were black only beaches, white only beaches, black only post offices, white only post offices. But the policy of apartheid actually went much further than this and meant that black people had fewer legal rights in South Africa and they also were not allowed to vote. 
This situation led to increased political violence in the country that culminated in the Sharpeville massacre of 1960. Uh, a number of people protested outside a local police station against the pass laws. Passes were effectively an identity card that black people had to carry around with them so that the police could keep an eye on them and track their movements. The protest became febrile around midday and the police reacted violently, um, shooting into the crowd and ultimately killing around nine, 69 people. The picture that you can see on the right of the slide is from the Sharpeville massacre. From this point on, the main protest group that favoured black people, the African National Congress, realised that it was no good to negotiate with the National Party anymore. Instead, the only way that they would achieve their political goals was through political violence. And so throughout the 70s and the 80s, there was a constant campaign from the ANC of political violence, including a number of terrorist acts, as they were called by the National Party. Towards the end of this period, the attacks by the ANC were also met with international sanctions from abroad. And in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the president, F.W. de Klerk, realised that the system of apartheid in South Africa was no longer feasible as a means of government. He worked with Nelson Mandela, who was released from prison during this period, and they worked together towards a transition to full democracy. This was a, a long and arduous road um, that included a referendum on the political reforms and almost sort of uh, spilled over into violence itself at different points. Um, but it, eventually South Africa held its first free and democratic elections in 1994 and Nelson Mandela was elected as the country's new president. Now, the TRC was actually founded as one of the first things that the ANC government did under Nelson Mandela through the Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act 1995. The membership of the commission was made up of a variety of different sources. So uh, we've got pictures on the bottom there. Um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the chairperson of the commission uh, and is probably their most famous member. On to the right of him, we have Alex Bahrain, who was the deputy chairman and a former Liberal member of parliament. Um, we also have, moving left to right, Sisi Kampipi, uh, Wynand Milan and Emma Machini. Now, within the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there were three committees uh, that were set up and each had their own mandate. So the Human Rights Violations Committee investigated human rights abuses that took place between 1960, so the date of the Sharpeville massacre, and 1994. Meanwhile, the Reparation and Rehabilitation Committee was charged with restoring victims' dignity and formulating proposals to assist with rehabilitation. Finally, the Amnesty Committee was probably the most controversial out of all of these. It considered application for amnesty that were requested in accordance with the provisions of the Act. So let's have a look at some examples that came up in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The four people that you see there are referred to as the Craddock Four, and late in June 1985, the South African security forces set up a roadblock to intercept a car near the city of Port Elizabeth. Now, two of the four people in the car were activists and had secretly been targeted for assassination by the police. The police abducted the four and murdered them in cold blood. They then burnt their bodies that were later found near the Port Elizabeth suburb of Blue Water Bay. Now, this incident we would never know the truth about without the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. One of the daughters of the victims came forward and was the youngest person to ever give evidence before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he, she gave the quote that's on the right hand side of the page there. We want to forgive, but whom should we forgive? Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who you remember is the chairperson of the TRC, um, argued that this was the key fo founding principle behind the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This idea of wanting to forgive people and this idea of forgiveness amongst South Africans as a population, but also being able to identify the perpetrators of crimes and therefore um, who people should actually be able to forgive. It raises an, another interesting linguistic issue because the idea behind the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the sort of standing dogma, was that the truth would lead to reconciliation 
But what we have here in this quote is the idea that wanting to forgive is suggest suggesting that the offer of reconciliation could actually lead to the truth. So it would be the other way around. Another interesting example of the work of the truth and reconciliation was to explore the role of the security police. On the left of the screen there, you have a picture of Griffiths Mzengi, who was a well-known black lawyer and anti-apartheid activist. He was described as a thorn in the side of the authorities. And the hit squad, um, which was led by the man on the right, Dirk Kuetsi, um, he was an officer in the security police and explained to the Truth Commission that he was ordered to make a plan with Griffiths Mzengi. Now, make a plan, he revealed, was an alternative way of saying eliminate or assassinate Griffiths Mzengi. In particular, Kuetsi was told not to shoot Mzengi, but to make it look like a robbery. So in November 1981, they abducted the black lawyer in his car, stabbed him 45 times and has hit him on over the head with a spanner as well. Now, this was all revealed by Kuetsi during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but it raises quite a controversial issue. The Mzengi family at the time um, applied to the Constitutional Court of the country to have the amnesty clause of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Act that we just looked at set aside as unconstitutional. Now, the court rejected this application and what eventually happened was that Kurtzi uh, received full amnesty for the crimes that he had committed during this period. Now, this is another example of the potential disadvantage of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Sizwe Kondile was also murdered and had her body burned by Dirk Kurtzi, who we saw on the previous slide. Her mother, Mrs. Charity Condile, came before the Truth and Reconciliation and Kurtzi explained that he would like to meet her and uh, ask for an apology in person. Now, the quote that we have here is Mrs. Condile's uh, lawyer's response to this. Um, you said that you would like to meet Mrs. Condile and look her in the eye. She asked me to tell you that she feels it is an honour you do not deserve. If you are really sorry, you would stand trial for the deeds that you did. In other words, the idea being that Kurtzi should never have received amnesty for the crimes that he committed. Um, instead, he should be forced to stand trial. And that is the only way that Mrs. Condile would actually feel that she has received justice. Finally, let's consider some of the advantages and disadvantages of the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa. The first major advantage was that it presented the idea of a national catharsis. In other words, everyone got to have their say. Whether they were a victim or a perpetrator of crimes, everyone got to explain their position in a long and extended process. Whilst this uh, did take a long time and the final report is very long, the idea behind the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was that the truth would set them free, that by uh, being allowed to explain and talk about their stories, they would be able to sort of move beyond this and have this cathartic moment. Another key idea put forward for the Truth Commission by Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the idea of restorative rather than retributive justice. In other words, to bring cases or trials against all of the perpetrators of crime during this period would be a horrendously expensive process that would cost, cost the country millions of pounds. Instead, would it not be better to use that money to alleviate poverty or to help rebuild communities that have been devastated by apartheid? This links into the bottom of the slide where I've talked about a chance for society to move forward. In other words, would it really help race relations in South Africa if there was a system of retributive justice that effectively created a white versus black civil war in South Africa? Instead, if the countries can come together or the white and the black communities can come together and have an understanding of what happened during apartheid, that is going to be a lot better for more harmonious race relations in the future. Uh, there are a number of disadvantages as well. So this gap between truth and reconciliation is really interesting. One of the major criticisms of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was that the truth doesn't necessarily lead to reconciliation. One of the complaints put forward was that if, for example, a perpetrator said, oh yes, I killed X, I poisoned another person and I tortured another person, just because they've told the truth doesn't necessarily lead to uh, any sense of forgiveness. That truth is actually a very sterile thing and very neutral 
Um, and it, whereas reconciliation or forgiveness is quite an emotive term that actually requires active participation by both uh, perpetrator and victim. We've already talked about the amnesty handed out to Dirk Kurtzi, um, which was considered to be extensive in itself. A number of other people also got off uh, for crimes that they had committed because of the amnesties granted by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is a major criticism, um, but others have argued that the amnesties actually allowed South Africa to move forward. Other people talked about the um, nature of media attention in South Africa. Obviously Nelson Mandela was a huge figure and so the world's media attention focused on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when it began its work in 1996. A lot of people who um, gave evidence before the Truth and Reconciliation spoke of a pressure to forgive people. In other words, the Commission would force its own doctrine of forgiveness onto the victims even when those victims didn't necessarily want to forgive the perpetrators who had committed crimes against them. So I think the most interesting conclusion that we can come to about the advantages and disadvantages of not only the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but also truth commissions in general, is in this quote. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission must fail. Its task is simply too demanding. Yet even as it fails, it has already succeeded beyond any rational expectation. This uh, for me is quite a complex conclusion, but I think it, to get to the point of it, it's saying that of course the Truth Commission was not going to satisfy everyone. Its demand in terms of the evidence it had to hear, in terms of the final report it had to compile within a set time period, was always very demanding and there was no way that it was going to be to everyone's satisfaction. However, even in that process of truth and reconciliation that occurred within the Commission, we can say that it has succeeded in the sense of bringing South Africa forward as a society. So, OK, it wasn't perfect, but in its attempt to get to the truth and in its attempt to reconcile South African society, it can generally be seen as a success. Well, thank you very much for watching this short video and I hope you found it as a useful introduction for writing your own piece of coursework. I think that the reason I find truth commissions so interesting as an area of study is because they go much further beyond simply what the law is. They concern issues of sociology, of politics, of morality, all at a time when a country is on the verge of changing. Remember when you're writing your coursework that you can use a range of different sources. So, for example, the UN Commission reports I referred to um, in my presentation are all available online. The work of the ICTJ is also very useful. Um, remember to use journals from Westlaw and Lexis Library as well. And finally, if you're interested in examining the primary resources, then the reports and work of the Truth Commissions are available all online as well. Um, good luck with it. Uh, leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it and if you have any questions then leave them in the comment box below and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching. Bye!